good morning everyone uh, this is day 3 of the webinar series on marine mammal conservation in india and uh, today we'll have a panel discussion with uh, the speakers of the past sessions and also good morning everyone uh, this is day 3 of the webinar series on i'm sorry for that uh, that's our youtube that goes live every time we speak from here and uh, we have with us uh, another uh, another uh, panel uh, panelist dr vardhan patankar i'll introduce all the panelists here uh, before starting the panel discussion uh, the panel is chaired by dr shivakumar he is uh, head of the endangered species management department at wildlife institute of india and also works as a scientist f here and leading the national uh, dugong recovery program uh, at the institute we have dr dipani sutaria she is adjunct senior fellow at the james cook university and also a visiting faculty at cpt university ahmedabad we have dr mridula shrinivasan director of the nmfs southeast fisheries center and uh, director of also marine mammal and turtle division at noa united states of america we have dr elrica disuza she is a research associate at uh, nature conservation foundation and uh, works has been working on dugongs uh, since a very long time and we have uh, with us uh, dr vardhan vardhan is currently program head of uh, wildlife conservation society india he has uh, done his uh, phd in coral reef ecology and local community resource utilization patterns over the past few years he has worked on a range of basic and applied studies in marine systems and uh, in his current profile he is uh, giving strategic direction to different projects of wcs india marine program by working with a network of individuals as well as national and international organizations uh, welcome vardhan uh, you are joining us for the first time here in this webinar series and uh, i would like to initiate uh, the panel discussion uh, with a brief uh, uh, introduction on how the panel discussion will go on so it will have a question asked to each of the panelists and with a response time of 10 to 15 minutes you can take 10 to 15 minutes to answer to the question that uh, you have been asked and then we'll have a 15 minute discussion over the broader webinar topic that is uh, marine mammal conservation in india and the perspectives from uh, india basically a developing country and what are the uh, challenges and what is the way forward in uh, conserving marine mammals in india and uh, then we'll have a question answer session uh, the questions asked by our attendees uh, who are uh, watching us on the zoom meeting platform as well as uh, on the youtube platform i'll begin uh, my uh, i'll begin this panel discussion with uh, dr shiv kumar uh, sir uh, the question to you uh, for this panel discussion is uh, uh, what are the current challenges in decision making for marine mammal conservation in india so we would like to have your thoughts about it uh, thank you dr anand Uh, good morning all of you and uh, good night to dr mirdala <laughs> it's a midnight actually uh, thank you for joining this panel discussion in fact this is a discussion uh, driven by young researcher at wai in fact i suggested some topic and but uh, dr anand given me very uh, tricky questions to me how <laughs> uh, the current challenges in decision making it's really a challenges uh, some of you might have involved in fact all of you involved uh, Uh, the, those who are listening in the webinar also some of you might have experienced because this system is a marine ecosystem still we don't know who are the stakeholders uh, identification of the stakeholders recognition of the stakeholders itself is a big challenge right now happening in our country that actually hampering the decision making actually that is the biggest challenges uh and uh, i will come through uh, to that particular point at the end of the things because based on our own experiences with respect to turtle conservation action plan or a dugong conservation action plan or even the marine mammal standing network management plan there are challenges it is not that much easy task because the researcher we think in a differently a bureaucratic system in india thinks uh, totally differently Uh, sometimes we feel bad uh, no uh, disappointed not a bad is a disappointed that the system not taking the our views completely so happen uh, uh, i i will discuss those things also in a quickly uh, coming to the marine mammal concern as i told earlier also india has less than 1% of the world marine environment in our country precisely if we talk we have only 0.6% of the 
marine environment ecosystem in of the world with us but fortunately we have about 30 percentage of marine mammal diversity in our country that's amazing and we have a smallest thing that the uh, reason for that is the marine mammals are mostly a migratory animal a uh, few may be having a resident population uh, we don't know maybe dr dibani or uh, edrika vardhan may we'll talk later on about uh, research when we're discussing that but mostly these animals are migratory in nature they visit india maybe leaving india and using our habitat for certain purposes which may be a critical uh, for this animal just one thing so india is playing a major role in conservation of marine mammals if you look at to the global perspective and then what we have at a policy level decision is the biggest conflict of uh, you know, policies we have it uh, right now recently when we are working with the uh, world conservation society where vardhan is belongs to uh, we were planning to you know uh, request the government to declare the angria bank as the uh, conservation important area we don't want to declare that area as an either a special park or sanctuary which we can't do it when we approach the government then we come to know that the existing policy Uh, that is the wildlife protection act which is the main act we have right now can actually declare any uh, area as a protected area unfortunately we can't use the wildlife protection act to declare angria bank as a protected area then what will happen to that which is very important it is a, within the ez of india and the india has uh, all the rights to do anything uh, or manage those ez but unfortunately we cannot notify then we found that there is another act called maritime zone act which is have it in our country and uh, that act actually implemented by largely by the indian coast guard now indian coast guard also has its own act actually it's called in coast guard act actually so we have a coast guard act maritime uh, zone act and uh, then there is a one international convention international convention on law of sea there's a third act so we have one national act two national acts and then one international uh, policy which can take care of the ease that of the any country and the ease that means that is all the marine fauna and flora whatever it is there so these are the policy decision now by and large in indian situation the ministry of environment and forest or the state forest department takes the responsibility of taking care of the wildlife in course marine mammal is a wildlife only many people even don't know about that they think that marine animals are aquatic animals that they don't consider as a wildlife but it is wildlife so there's a mere responsibility now coming to our marine mammal many of the most of the population seems to be occurs outside the territorial water but within the ease that of our country <clears throat> now when we go beyond the territorial water then the existing wildlife protection act uh, seems to be not uh, uh, helpful for us so i don't know I, we have to really uh, take the legal advice there is uh, uh, opinion on this but it looks like that uh, that wildlife protection act very difficult to reach beyond the territorial water so now we left with the two acts one is on class that is a international uh, convention on uh, law of sea in which india is a signatory if that also protect the endangered or rare fauna which occurs in the sea one thing second we have our own act that is a maritime zone act that also takes care of the uh, marine environment ecology that is said they are taken then we have a coast guard act coast guard act also clearly mentioned that they have to take care of the protect the marine environment marine pollution of course the marine pollution we have to review that existing act because they talks only about oil spill uh, we have to add other uh, pollution in that then it also talks about a rare animal then coming to the coast guard act coast guard act if you visit their website in the mission of the document of the coast guard clearly mentioned that the responsibility to, to protect the marine environment of course interest of the country in e said that is the main objective of the coast guard interest means lot of things uh, industry uh, well being of the fishermen community and well being of the any sailors who come to the country for a port trade related issues and then marine environment pollution and also it clearly mention rare animals very interesting okay that is their mandate also now this is what we have right now it looks like that coast guard is the main authority can do something and post something in the with respect to marine mammals in the ez or we need as some other ministry such as ministry of fisheries or ministry of environment or ministry of other anything else where 
they are operating that area can be involved if they want to involve what needs to be done i think the existing policy may not allow this ministry to work in that area efficiently even if you allow then there are a lot of other challenges so, so i will list to those challenges also one by one now since that uh, Indian Coast Guard is the responsibility of taking care of the EEZ, including the rare fauna. They have done a lot of good job in earlier. One experience I can share with you that is called Operation Olivia. That Olive Ridley Turtle Conservation Program became most successful in Odisha, of course. That is because of intervention of the Coast Guard. So what's happened 20 years before? The only the State Forest Department trying their level best to, to take care of the, the species. But we used to live a loose several thousands of olive ridley every year because of the fisheries interface. Many turtles getting uh, entangled in the fishing net, they used to stand. We couldn't do anything. Then the department started talking with the Coast Guard, Marine Police, Navy, fisheries. Then they came together, the major role played by the Indian Coast Guard. Then they successfully regulated the fisheries activity inside the marine protected area of the Kagirimada. That's what they be good drastically minimize the uh, sea turtle mortality in Orissa Coast. That's one classical good example we have it in that. And then Coast Guard also right now, yesterday Dr. Anand Pandey was talking about that, how Coast Guard and Navy helping the dugong conservation. It was a yearly, we struggled a lot to convince these people, still we are struggling because the officers in the regional center keep on changing it. So every time for us to go and you know, orient them and brief them, it became a big challenge, but still, uh, they're helping us. So there is a, something like, you know, the, whatever maximum they can do, they're helping us uh, in uh, dugong conservation. That means everybody willing to help, actually. That's what I, my personally feeling in the last four or five years, we, we go on to talk with any officials, with the, any ministry in the government, everybody want to help the marine mammal conservation. But unfortunately, uh, it is not happening in the field. I don't know the reason, probably... Uh, we are the only people are concerned about a marine mammal, others may not. Or the priority of their activities may be changing through the time. I don't know exactly. But whenever we go and meet the people, any ministry, any department, the state or a central level, everybody want to help, want to conserve the wildlife. But unfortunately, not happening in the ground level. That's the one thing, one gap is that. But now coming to the marine mammal things, Exactly, we don't know right now what is the spatial and temporal distribution of marine mammals in our country. Since we don't have that information, right now we have to go for a, any policy covering the entire coastal area, which would be a very, very difficult for us to implement. Although there are issues, the main issues which I discussed earlier also, one is the bycatch problems, another is the securing the habitat problem, because majority of the marine mammal habitat in India seems to be hostile, seems to be, I'm, I'm not sure. We don't know exactly what are the uh, critical habitat of marine mammal in our country, whether those habitats are really hostile for with respect to fisheries or any other development because there is hydrocarbon exploration going on. A lot of ship profits are there. There are many things we don't know exactly. So these are the data cap probably the, my panelists will discuss those things and that. So once we know the problem, uh, we can actually pinpoint that uh, problem and then find a minus solution, focus the solution. But right now, what we can think about that, we can straight away start the bycatch reduction program and then try to secure the habitat. We, we discussed already, there is a potential of declaring all the important marine mammal areas identified by the IUCN, and then EPSA site, then Angria Bank. At least if you add those things, we can save something there. And then the securing habitat, very important, then awareness. And what we do, the current decision making, why people are, you know, there's a challenge in the decision making because even the decision makers are not aware. That's the problem. We believe, we think that only the common people don't have awareness. Probably the fisherman community may be knowing better than actually what we know actually. The problem with the decision maker, they don't have much awareness. So we have to create awareness from the top to down actually. Uh, starting from the policy maker, the decision maker, bureaucrat, then coming to the local level. Okay, this is what the awareness, either way we can do it. But what I realized that, that the awareness needs to be created, many people, many sectors. Okay, why many sectors? Because there is a lack of in the sector coordination. As I told you already, several ministries are operating in the system and they're very difficult for everybody to come together. 
so we have to actually bring those intersector coordination for that also we need awareness so that's one thing and then another important thing is the po major policy shift uh, whether we can expand the existing wildlife protection act to up to the ez that's the one thing we do it and uh, based on our experience in the past that many fishery sector may not like the forest sector to take over their responsibility because many country the fishery department takes care of the marine protected area they are doing very good job especially if you look at the any pacific uh, portion countries or including our neighbor country although sri lanka both wildlife division and fishery department jointly take care of the marine protected area but in india protected area means it comes under the state forest department right now okay and the state rights goes up to territorial water only now we have to expand the uh, rights of the beyond the territorial water whether state can do it or central can do it if central want to do it then we have to bring a concern policy whether we can declare any there is a provision in the maritime zone act that we can notify any area which are conservation important whether we can strengthen that act and then improve something in the indian coast guard act so that the coast guard given major responsibility of enforcement that's so one thing when you are involved the coast guard whether fishermen will accept or not whether we can give some provision in the existing indian fishery act to bring the marine protected area there so these are the negotiation we have to discussion we have to make it that is a because nobody knows flu actually if you approach anybody in the ministry different ministry doesn't know because the officer also sometimes may not aware of that how many people are aware of the marine mammal many people does know is a machi only whale machi that is a feeling people have it's a anything under the water in the sea are fish only so this kind of awareness lack of awareness that is the biggest challenges bring all the sectors together and do something like that so that's what who will manage the habitat and population of the marine mammals in the beyond the territorial water that itself we are not very clear if that clarity comes to us probably we will remove all the challenges and then we have we can actually hopefully conserve our marine mammal more successfully so that's what i want to uh, tell now maybe i will come back later thank you thank you sir uh, thanks for your comments uh, on the question posed to you and uh, you're recommending a, a top down approach in uh, generating awareness uh, for marine mammal conservation in india we'll have questions to you asked uh, if you uh, of if the attendees are asked want to ask a question to the panelists please type the name of the panelist and ask your question in the q and a tab uh, at the bottom of the window next with us is uh, dr dipani uh, dipani talked about uh, uh, young researchers leading marine mammal research and conservation activities in india throughout uh, the coast of india and uh, from this perspective we would like to ask her that what what are the way what is the way forward to strengthen marine mammal research in india and uh, do you have any specific uh, suggestion to uh, the the upcoming researchers and upcoming scientists uh, for strengthening this particular uh, conservation objective in the country good morning everyone uh, panelists hello hi how are you how are you hi hi but um okay. yeah so where do i start from um I, i'm sorry i think i have a lot of things that i'm seeing that overlap with what vardhan and elvi also might want to say later and i'm sorry for that but we can just build the discussion together in the end also so i I'll just stop me when 10 minutes are over otherwise uh, hopefully i'll finish before that uh, so the first thing i might i want to say is i might just look back at my journey because i was lucky i think to have guides or supervisors who encouraged me rather than told me not to do this even somebody like rohan athar who's like doesn't want to study dolphins ever in his life kind of attitude uh, did not discourage me at that point of time Uh, so uh, when a, when a student is inspired by a certain either a species or a habitat or an ecosystem or an interaction whatever it is that inspires them we should have somebody uh, somebody to be able to say yeah this is interesting and let's go ahead and design this further or you know tweak it apart so that it's less it's more sadly speaking i don't like to use this word much anymore scientific because i don't agree with all the things that who has said but anyway so uh, but but we tweak we help the student to re um, reframe the question or the behavior or the or the observation so that they can struct then then decide a structure to use uh, to answer that question or that query so the first thing of course would be inspiration let the inspiration be there let your students go out into the field and get experience with those who are 
doing any marine mammal research. If they are able, they can leave the country and try and volunteer somewhere outside to see what this work actually entails. Because to a lot of people who are like, oh, they're studying dolphins, oh, wow, oh, wow, but that's not how it is. If you come and spend some time with us, I've had students who've left. Uh, because after you've studied frogs or snakes or birds, you have to be on the boat for hours and not see anything. Uh, you cannot jump into the water because it's very strict etiquette on the boat that you have to search all the time. You cannot stop looking. So a lot of people leave. It's not that it's not as, as much fun as it sounds. You can ask anybody in WIA or anywhere else. Um, so get the experience first. I think in India, if you want to strengthen this, you have to let students come out into the field, experience it, and then we come to the point of academia. We have no university. I'll, I'll take this up later. Uh, we have no universities or dedicated programs for marine mammal science. I remember there was one time, I don't know who the coordinator of the NCBS course was that time, but I gave a few classes in the first or second batch of, NC, of the wildlife biology course in NCBS. And I have suggested to WII many times, but I've not got a response. <laughs> a response. But, um, but we have these things in our, in our country. I've written to every fisheries college in India, but they say the protocol is that you have to be an in-house professor if you want to teach here. So there are all these kind of hurdles which are unnecessary, I think. But academia would be very, very important, as I said, to structure a researcher's uh, thoughts. Uh, I'm not necessarily saying you have to do a PhD. I, I'm just saying that it's a very, it's, it teaches you the right process to go into the, into the aspect of research if you want to do research. Uh, question asking or you either want to ask a question or you want to solve a conservation problem, you want to solve a threat, you do social science, you don't have to do ecology only. So uh, there are all these interdisciplinary things that need to be taken into consideration. I don't think wildlife biology or wildlife conservation is today what it was 40 years ago, 30 years ago. No, lo no longer the same paradigms that we follow. So all our coursework needs to be very interdisciplinary. Um, after that, I would say opportunities and funding. Um, I get, we get emails, everybody on, if you look at our About Us list on the website, everybody gets emails from people every, few, every year that we want to come, we want to come, and we never say no. Uh, even though it is difficult for us to have somebody just for a week or just for 10 days because we train this person, but still it gives them a chance or gives them an opportunity to at least dive once into this field of work, right? So all of us need to be more open for internships, paid, unpaid, volunteerships. Um, and then there then, then needs to be funding uh, for these projects. This funding can come from the national government. It can come from the state government. It can come from NGOs, whatever. Um, and then there should, needs to be collaborations. We need to be very, very open with collaborations within NGOs, within country, with uh, government organizations, non-government organizations, or even with just people like me who are not with any organization. You know? um, so, so the teaching part, I'm guessing, will, will be covered a bit more by, by Ulrika. Uh, and then there's the state involvement at the policy level. I feel this is really, really important for researchers to be accepted. The researchers are still looked upon as people who create trouble. They create results that are probably seen as anti-development. Um, funding does not go to certain researchers, but will go to other researchers. The centralization of research is, is one of the biggest, riskiest things that conservation will have to deal with in the coming future, not only in India, but in the entire world, I think. I think it's a, we, have, we are in a very risky time in, on, on the, in the entire world that uh, conservation is going to get sidelined in uh, comparison to defense and development. And I'm saying it very openly that all of us young people at least will have to decide if biodiversity is important enough to be given priority or not. It's high time we decide, we'll have to take that stance. Either you just be in the lab and keep collecting data and analyzing it and not care what happens with the data, or you decide why you're doing this in the first place, you know. Um, so these are all, and of course, the Wildlife Act. If any of you have read the Wildlife Act and looked at the list of marine mammals in it, you will be shocked because um, uh, it's just, it's all over. It's because there's no data, they've just put certain things here, certain things there, or there are wrong, wrong uh, marine mammals listed in the Wildlife Act. So it's time to amend the Wildlife Act also. I think they've tried to do it for Elasmo brands, brands. I don't know if the schedule has been also tried to be worked on for marine mammals for India. Um, so I think these are the things that come to mind. I think my first or always thing is inspiration and experience. And after that, the students can decide, researchers can decide 
what to do next. Uh, we also need that expertise in different in institutions, organizations, or we invite people here uh, for a summer or for a semester to teach specially, especially with the veterinary sciences, we really need that. Uh, I don't think we need that as much for sample design and all that. We have very good people within India to teach us everything that has to do with uh, ecology. We need people to teach us stuff to do with veterinary sciences, really. Um, and I, th I think that's it for now. Um, I don't know if this is what you all were expecting. I read, read, all, read the question only this morning before I came here. But, uh, but maybe it'll be more fun when people ask question answers. Then we'll know where to go. Thank you, Dipani. Uh, thanks for your comments. And uh, you brought together almost all the points that are plaguing uh, marine mammal research in the country. And uh, we'll talk about it more. And of course, we'll have questions from uh, our attendees and questions. Uh, even the panelists can ask uh, questions to each other. And uh, we can, uh, we'll go ahead uh, with to Dr. Mridula. Uh, Mridula, we have uh, from, uh, you are coming from uh, a country which has managed marine mammals uh, better than at least India. And uh, we would like to know your comments on, uh, uh, from a global marine mammal research community, what are your comments on guiding policies and marine mammal research in India? Although you covered it up in your presentation as well, but we would like to have it in the discussion as well. Hi, first of all, hello everyone. It's nice to see everybody. <laughs> um, well, again, like the Pani, I also happened to look at the, the topic this morning. Um, so I have not had much time to uh, ruminate over this. But I would argue that um, I don't know if we have done a really good job in in the U.S. protecting marine mammals. Um, I think we've spent a lot of time um, understanding uh, the biology, ecology of marine mammals, and you know, doing a lot of studies. And we have the capacity, the expertise. But I don't know if we have achieved our conservation goals. Um, we a lot of the marine mammals still remain. Uh, protected. And that's, I think, part of the reason why I think people feel things are better here is because we have the Marine Mammal Protection Act, which just protects all marine mammals domestically, internationally. So legislatively, we have a lot of protection. The other thing um, I think that's important is that, and I think the crucial thing, and that's why it goes back to Dipani's point about amending the Wildlife Protection Act, is the MMPA is one of the few legislations, and I mentioned this yesterday, that has a scientific basis. It requires you to have solid science to support conservation. Um, very few legislations have that. Um, the, we even have an Endangered Species Act in the US, but it doesn't talk anything about what science is needed to delist a species, you know, recover a species. It's all about, here, protect this animal. You can't injure this animal. You can't um, take this animal but there's no scientific guiding principles. Whereas the MMPA, which is I think really unique and such a strong legislation that it has the scientific basis. And I think that's very important. Uh, I it's just, I guess, given the way things are right now, <laughs> I'm, I'm a little cynical about uh, <laughs> where we are globally, as well as uh, I think nationally, I'm actually more inspired and motivated by things happening now in India, where there is a little more attention being given, oh, there's a project dolphin, and you know, there is interest in um, assessing marine mammals, which is a good thing, because that curiosity or the discovery is dying here, uh, to be very honest with you. Uh, we don't get the ship time or the ability to go and survey all our marine mammals. Uh, I think I mentioned yesterday that we've identified 332 marine mammal stocks, of which 80% are inadequately assessed, according to our criteria, which is, you know, having good population information, good having stock structure information, threats information. So it goes to show that even with a lot of investment, early investments, or really a, a highly accomplished scientist, that we're still not meeting the so-called criteria or the goals or thresholds. So it is a struggle. Um, and the other thing is we, we are, um, NOAA in particular, and I think um, this is where I think government and academia differs, is that we are science for management. That is our principal driver. Um, and so there is this constant tussle between trying to answer hypothesis-driven questions versus, hey, my manager needs some information data tomorrow or next month or six months from now because there is some development activity going on, whether it's oil and gas or defense um, activity. 
Um, and so we are collecting data to support that action. Um, and so as a consequence of that, um, a lot of times we're not able to focus on the basic biological data collection. So always what happens is you end up, you know, fighting a lawsuit or something else where you are arguing a decision based on imperfect science or uncertain science or science where we have limited confidence. Um, and that's the, the dichotomy of science and management that I think it's a perennial battle throughout the world. I, I don't think it's just here, it's everywhere. Um, and I think young researchers, when they see that, they, uh, they don't realize it. So in school, when we go to universities, we're not taught that. We're not taught about how science is important for conservation or for management or how difficult it is to just study what you do. When you're doing a master's or PhD, you're like oh, so excited and enthusiastic about the information you're collecting. And then you're like, oh, this is all going to be used by somebody and you know, all, everything will be changed and marine mammals will be conserved. But that's not reality. You know, we don't get that reality check in university. It's only when you start working professionally that you realize that it's not, um, it's not that green. The grass is really not greener on the other side. It, it is complicated, it's complex. Um, and so we are always struggling with um, understanding how to improve the science at the same time being responsive um, to management questions, which is very important. You know, it's, it's equally important when you're in an applied agency. Um, the other thing I, and I, I guess, in terms of science and management is that seems that I always go back to that because that is what is the undercurrent driving everything we're doing right now. Um, and when you are not investing in the science, we're not able to address the chronic issues, whether it's climate change or ecosystem shifts um, or distributional shifts in species, we're focused on very, our, our, our aim is very myopic at the moment. and. Um, I'm hoping that things will change uh, because things are really serious. You know, we have some serious uh, conservation threats, whether it's from ocean noise or whether it's um, climate change, um, whether it's fishing. I mean, fisheries is a huge continued threat, uh, but we're still not able to address that problem. We're struggling with that. Um, we we don't have enough solutions, and we're not. We're always either in direct confrontation mode or we are compromising completely. So there's there's always that struggle and depends on the region and where you are with what type of fishery, what type of gear, um, that sometimes you have good solutions, but a lot of times we don't. So that, I guess that's, I, and I don't know what else to talk about in terms of the global situation. I, I think marine mammal conservation requires some injection of fresh blood and uh, fresh thinking. Um, and I think India is really poised to make a huge difference globally. Uh, because I think, you know, I said yesterday that we are in the path of discovery. We're just at sort of that curve of trying to learn things and understand uh, our marine mammals and Indian waters. And it's, it's, a, it's a really exciting moment. If we do the things the right way, support our students, support the researchers, then you can see a really very prominent growth. And the most important thing I think for India is to learn from the mistakes from all the other agencies and other countries, and make sure we don't repeat that. Um, I think there are enough lessons to be learned uh, from other places. And I think that's very important for us. Thank you, Mridla, for your thoughts. And uh, you are uh, saying that uh, we need to move uh, forward towards a proactive research and management rather than a reactionary research and management that is happening all over the world uh, with yeah. respect to marine mammals. So thank you for that. Uh, we would like to now uh, call upon Dr. Elrika. Elrika talked about her research uh, in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands yesterday on uh, dugongs. So Elrika, you are, I think, the best person to answer this question posed to you, which is uh, what should be the role of independent young researchers in marine mammal conservation in India? And what are the hurdles in conducting research right now? And what could be your thoughts? Uh, what are your thoughts about uh, ways to address it? Address uh, the hurdles in, the, in conducting research. Good morning, everyone. So to start off with, uh, I'd like to say that there are very few uh, marine, marine institutes in India, be it uh, government or uh, 
non government uh, institute and um, within these institutes there is i would say i think there is no dedicated marine mammal program in any of these institutes you do have uh, you know uh, programs that uh, have a bit of the marine uh, the mammal component and other animals as well but there is no dedicated marine mammal program in any of these um, institutes uh, right now so uh, as a result what has uh, happened is that there's a lot of uh, not there are a lot of knowledge gaps in what we know about uh, marine mammals uh, today and uh, most of these institutes that are the, the marine institutes right now also hire um researchers based on either existing uh, projects but uh, there is i think it's it's rare that you know a researcher can actually uh, who's interested in studying marine mammals can actually go to an institute and uh, uh you know who uh, have their uh, project within this uh, institute it's mostly based on an existing project and hiring of uh, researchers so what what does a uh, what does uh, an independent researcher interested in studying marine mammals do then so um this it's it's not easy for a researcher to uh, work uh, independently i think in india especially when it comes to marine mammal uh, research but they are key i think um, independent researchers they play a very important role in filling all these knowledge gaps because they are the ones who have the interest and the determination to actually do this uh, research and hence we, these are the these researchers are key i feel and should be encouraged to uh, to ca carry on their researchers uh, to carry on their research so um, having said that like i said it's not at all easy and one of the uh, the main difficulty or just the starting point of it is just securing funds to carry out these research so presently given the the present situation and the changes that are happening in the fcra act and uh, you know just securing uh, funds it's 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 going to be very difficult uh, getting funds uh, for an independent uh, researcher in working in india and uh, they might be smaller very uh, small grants that are available to researchers but i'm not sure whether these will actually be uh, uh, you know will actually be able to support the kind of work or the kind of uh, money that uh, marine mammal research requires uh second is they, it's always a struggle to prove your capability as an independent researcher starting from the point of uh, uh, you know uh, proving uh, uh, or uh, defending your your proposal at uh, for at the permit stage so you'll always be uh, you, you'll always be questioned about your capabilities and uh, the third is that just the, the logistics and the infrastructure involved in doing this it's not about terrestrial some terrestrial research where you can just go out with a notebook it involves boats it involves uh, diving gear if you have to go under water it involves a lot of expensive uh, uh, gear and it, it it's not easy to get the funds uh, for this or even for, for just just getting all of this together and keeping it somewhere where you can take it out every day and go on to a field so some of the um, ways that uh, you know over the years uh, i have uh, i have at some point of uh, time been able to overcome or even i've seen some of the uh, some of my uh, friends who are independent researchers at the moment and how they go about overcoming uh, these with securing funds i uh, i don't i think it's just going to get worse from now so uh, one uh, solution <clears throat> uh, we've also done this for some students in the past is that we've allowed or you know if students have had issues with uh, uh routing their funds we made exceptional uh, cases uh for that because because these rules keep on changing and sometimes students are not aware or researchers are not aware at the time of uh, sending out their proposals that you know there could be rules about receiving uh, funds into personal accounts um so we we made some uh, changes but like i said it, it's not always possible to do that and one must think very carefully about uh, this aspect of just the beginning of your uh, research the for the second and third about you know proving your capabilities or about the infrastructure and logistics i suggest that it's a it's a good practice to um, start off your research with uh, working with uh, uh, other researchers in the field for at least a year or two learning some of these skills uh, you know developing a rapport with uh, with the administration with the locals and uh, building building up 
uh, on a kind of a team it may not be a team of just other researchers but just on on a local building up on a local team because this is going to take you a long way in doing your research as an independent uh, no uh, researcher so just these if you if you start uh, you know interacting with the department way ahead of your uh, of your uh, of your independent researcher they will start seeing that uh, they will know of you for one and they will start seeing uh, you know that your working styles or uh, your determination or uh, your experience in this uh, field and uh, uh, it none of this will be possible with the local support because you will need local support as an independent researcher so you need to build up on that local team who can help you at any uh, time in this uh, during your um, research especially in uh, in remote locations like uh, in the islands and uh, last i would say it's important to just develop the skills of being positive or being uh, of being positive that you will be able to do your uh, research of being confident because uh, that's one thing that reflects and will also um, you know uh, help you in getting the building up the trust from others and to be determined and always have a plan b so that's all i have to say from my end thank you elrika uh, you are rightly saying that uh, there are issues with lack of funding and expensive gears uh, which are Uh, affecting marine mammal uh, research, especially when it is taken up by independent young researchers, and uh, we need to work closely with uh, the state forest departments who are the protect, who are the uh, who are protecting uh, our wildlife, uh, and also get the support of local communities in uh, uh, carrying out our research. Thank you. Now we have with us uh, Dr. Vardhan. Vardhan has been working uh, with uh, non-governmental organizations since a long time, and he'll be. uh vardhan uh, your the question to you is uh, uh, what is the contribution of this, what could be the contribution of civil society in shaping marine biodiversity conservation research in india and uh, specifically uh, with implications on marine mammal conservation so uh, we know that you have been working on coral reefs since a very long time but uh, you have also been uh, in close association working in close association with elrica and uh, uh, working on dugongs uh, Uh, in the Andaman Islands. So, what are your uh, thoughts about uh, the role of civil society in this? Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, nice to see everyone, and thanks, Dr. Anand, Dr. Shiv Kumar, and WI, hosting this conference. Uh, so, <clears throat> and as I'm supposed to talk about contribution of civil society in shaping marine biodiversity conservation research, uh, and of course, its implication. uh for marine uh, mammal conservation i'll start talking about civil society uh, which i find mostly misunderstood term in india uh, because that is uh, it is mainly uh, confined to non government organizations or that's what is been uh, because even i uh, uh, when i go to field i often gets asked where do you work and they when i say that i work with this institute and i have done phd uh in institute which is non government it is often misunderstood and uh, civil society uh, bodies are not it's not the term is not confined to non government organization that is point number 1 i would like to say and uh, the term in fact encompasses other non state association as well as uh, so that are attempting to bring together individuals voices desires uh, etc uh, along with state policy and that's what state uh, civil society so generally speaking uh, civil society can include any institute or they it will include charities development ngos community groups professional associations uh, then fishermen forums trade unions uh, social movements advocacy groups uh, individuals uh, and of course all the ngos who are working uh in environment sector so it's a it's a it's a what is important to notice that it is not homogeneous body and uh, the boundaries of often between so, so civil society and government government or civil society and commercial sector uh can often get blurred and i think it is very important to uh uh keep this in mind that uh, that there is no one civil society or one civil society view and civil society actors need to be content with similar issues of representativeness and legitimacy and it's important to recognize there as there are different viewpoints that and i think according to me civil society can represent represent those viewpoints to the government for policy and action 
uh so that's something i would like to say besides i would uh, one another thing is i can support uh, as well as give constructive criticism to the government so it's is both uh, that you can work and you can criticize government and historically india has always had a presence of civil society even in uh, uh, uh kingsley time uh, and even in the past it was in the form of samitis in the form of sabhas where a uh, uh, body of uh, stakeholders they were representing and the, the the community and they were bringing different viewpoints uh, so this is something i would like to start my this the this uh, what civil society is or what are the way i understood uh, and by, the way i understand and when it comes to marine biodiversity i think it india has a uh, golden past eventful present and aspiring future and why i say uh, you know, golden past as a coral biologist i can say that that the first ever uh, and dr siva will agree with everyone that first ever international coral reef symposium was held in india in 1950s uh, besides some really good fundamental research was conducted um, uh, in uh, gulf of manar and in south in south india especially in mandapam there were dugongs were kept in captivity uh, uh, the uh, universities such as annamalai madurai kamraj university cmfri cmlre uh, to name few these are few institutes who have been very instrumental uh, in conducting and they have in fact been pioneering in conducting marine research and uh, for the conservation activities in india but the, what is the, what, what, what but if you look at the past and if you look at now what a change is that the earlier it was conduct the the research was confined or it was restricted to this uh premium institute uh, that uh, and their research or scientists working with them they were instrumental in leading the research and in fact right now we have very eventful past and why eventful is because uh, there is energy and there is synergy uh that is between different institutes individuals non government institute and uh, i i guess this uh, conference is one very good example this is uh, uh, there are many individuals who are doing some fun, really good research uh, such as uh, uh, terra conscious marine mammal network and there are many grassroots level organizations for marine biodiversity conservation such as kaso mitra there is uh, 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 there are some uh, even individuals who are contributing towards marine conservation and the good thing is that uh, their efforts uh are been recognized even vidila or all the researchers and all my peers as well as the current uh, uh, dr shivak kumar they recognize that there is a uh, good talent in uh, present and uh, it is valued and uh, why, and i i feel uh, that we have aspiring future because we are working together with present and dr shiv kumar and all all the panelists have already mentioned this the importance of working together dipani mentioned this uh, even alrika mentioned how difficult it is to work uh, to carry out research but then there is good encouragement and civil society uh, i feel i uh, it can often represent as this other view point that is often difficult for government to take up because there is a government agenda and they cannot go and that's where i think civil society can uh, play a very important role and they can to take that other view point to the policy makers and good thing is that people have started talking to each other of late rather than at each other and i think that's a really 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 good cha- change that i'm seeing over the past few years that i have been working and i've been as- associated and talking to a uh, few researchers and uh, my colleagues and peers and i think for conservation of marine biodiversity and marine mammals what we need that what of course besides working together we have to get everyone on board in fact all stakeholders we need uh, and we need every, uh, we need policy makers we need researchers we need individuals we, we need uh, uh, government institutes we need people who criticize us and tell us that hey you are going wrong uh, or they just uh, or we need ngos and uh, of course last one but not the least we need to consult local communities and what is their viewpoints and bring that up and if we can accept that individuals people organizations have different viewpoint and agendas and work together for common cause i think by keeping our personal egos and agendas aside i think we have made a very good headway and uh, even moving forward the way we are working i think if we continue doing this with lots of energy and synergy i think uh, uh, we will be able to uh, conserve some of our marine biodiversity 
and uh, dr siva the way he mentioned angria bank is a very good example while there has been lots of talk uh, about notifying angria bank for the past few years with uh, nio con conducting expeditions uh, and uh, different institutes uh, and moef and many institutes have been interested uh, the for the, in last one and a half years uh, we made a significant progress and the way it helped is uh, as dr uh, siva mentioned is first we looked at uh, uh, um uh, uh, our wildlife protection act and then we re we uh, realized that that's not perhaps uh, because uh, the jurisdiction is only till territorial water and because angria bank is an ez of the country we need to think of some other ways and then we thought the designated area is which is uh, is another act that we can use and uh, the persistence and collective action of not only wcs india but everyone uh, and all the friends all colleagues Uh, and uh, the, even when we conducted expedition, we worked together for common cause. Uh, Mangrove Foundation, uh, uh, WII, uh, all the individuals, colleagues, diver friends who have, who have been interested in exploring marine biodiversity. Even they all, we all came together, and we were able to conduct expedition. And hope we are, with that we will be able to notify the area. During expedition, we did see uh, many marine mammals and. Uh, uh, and why I'm mentioning Angria Bank, and I'm sure why uh, Dr. Siva was mentioning it, that was an expedition that was an EZ of the country where there are many marine mammal presence has been noticed or has been reported, and we were fortunate to go there and see it. And similarly for marine mammals, uh, 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 there is not only Angria Bank is on one, one example, uh, which was uh, led by institute. Even individual researchers can play a very important role. Uh, i would like to give example of mahi who works in andamans uh, with her determination uh, uh, and uh, she was the one who was uh, 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 conducting marine mammal surveys uh, with uh, guidance from dipani and uh, with her persistence uh, the area was able to, she was able to declare the area as uh, uh, ima which is important marine mammal area in south andaman and these are few examples we have right now so it's it doesn't matter mihir said mihir is and kitki they are very good example where they started work in 2000 uh, almost uh, 10 years ago i think 2008 uh, with a small referred grant and uh, we 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 worked together they established their base and then with the support and uh, from different individuals from uh, uh, mr vasudevan from undp from uh, uh mangrove foundation they were able to do lots of uh, work including photo id of um, indo pacific uh, dolphins and finless porpoise so i think just to uh, and this i think civil society is play a very important role and they can uh, uh bring that different viewpoints uh and uh, uh work together for policy and action thank you I think that's all I can say or think of right now. I think Anand is not online anymore, Siva sir. He doesn't show online. Uh, yes, actually, we got a big problem in internet. Our website uh, down, I think. So okay. I'm on the mobile phone. Uh, maybe I will continue. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Madan, uh, uh, for excellent. Uh, we of the civil society you given a actually that is the right definition civil society means people have a wrong perception that it is a ngo or not it is mm. not like that uh, then coming back to after listening to all four of you what i understood that uh, the research of course it's very important uh, research is important any management or conservation effort should led by the research only good research with uh, good capacity of the people who are managing it uh, in fact the wildlife protection act I, i always have the personal feeling that it should be renamed as a wildlife conservation act instead of a wildlife protection act this is a lesson learned from the endangered species act of the usa i uh, fortunately i was involved in the developing guideline for species recovery plan of the india uh, almost 10 years before i took uh, help of the endangered species act as well as the australian endangered species act so then we developed our own guidelines and adapted into indian situation that is again we are using it now we are actually shifting into uh, species focus to the community focus that's one thing coming to the research and uh, what uh, dr elrica felt or uh, others also feeling the same thing 
the funding opportunity because working in a marine environment uh, need a lot of uh, logistic support it is not like you know going with a binocular watching a bird i did it my phd was just using a one binocular i completed my phd and uh, i used to get you know maybe about 100 dollars in a month i used to spend that was the total expenditure of my project but that is not possible in marine system in marine system you need a gear we are not a aquatic animal we are a land animal then we have to become aquatic animal then for that we need like extra ancillary respiratory organs and all those things we required it and i'm telling you one thing that it is not with the government is not with the policy maker it is not problem with the decision maker unfortunately it is also problem with the scientific community and uh, i'm sure all of you are aware of that there is a recently think we've lost him also haven't we hello can you all unmute yourselves please and so we can talk yes looks like we've lost them yeah yeah we I, lost him i think brudula is the host aren't you brudula that's what's showing up in the panelists ah uh, no i am oh yes. really oh wow so, okay <laughs> maybe you can ask the participants if they want to ask us question and answers you will be able to talk to them i think we may not um let's Because see i can uh unless i think anybody can write i think uh, any any of us can ask that but yeah if anybody has any questions please type it in the chat message in the chat window or is there still... any way they can communicate yeah till anand and sir are back if anybody has any questions for us you can either ask or write them in the chat window i guess can you at least tell us if you all can hear us or not <laughs> can anybody raise their hand if they can hear brudula you want to say in case as a host they can hear i think yeah they can hear us yeah okay okay yeah there's okay. a hand new age problems seriously i'm doing it's too much for me there's always something um any questions from everyone anyone what should we do guys <laughs> well i had a sort of a question i guess it's Yeah. you know how difficult is it to build programs i mean the pani you in you, you have been really successful in you know supporting students and sort of building that foundational um program which is so is essential you know you have to start somewhere and once you have the logistics the infrastructure you want that to continue i think that then allows you to recruit more people and build on those projects um what i seeing is a lot of people take up independent projects whether it's the government or you know researchers they if you just take one off projects where you do something for 3 months or 6 months then there's no continuity in that right so you lose that data collection that's already been done and there's no scope for building it um so i've always struggled with that in how can we retain people to continue and build on programs um and we've always talked about you know i think in the workshop we were talking about pipelines right getting people in getting them attracted to marine science committing and making a career out of this but it's really hard i i realize it's really challenging and increasingly so i mean everybody wants a job now right i mean we all <laughs> want to survive so what are people's views on that i'm i'm sort of curious to see how do we support a long term program that will allow students to flourish the program to flourish data collection to flourish that will help managers as well so should i go first vardhan and rika yeah. please yeah 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 so yeah i agree with where you started with this the way you started the story you know uh, i was hoping that that all these organizations and fisheries colleges my uh, would have courses would have people interested in um, would have labs like we need labs the way you have in america and different universities you know so we need all that logistics in place it's not just the scientific data brother it's also conservation like i was saying this yeah. the, i gave a talk in the lab in jcu yesterday to the livelihoods lab 
and I talked about myself. I was like, I went and did this thesis titled Social and Ecological Factors Affecting Conservation in Chilka, but I'm not even back there since 2012. So, you know, it's not just the data, but it's also conservation that cannot really happen if you don't have a long term, you know, the way Elrika has been with the dugongs for so long, or with Vardhan with the reefs for so long, you need to have that continuity. Um, and hopefully everybody else who's doing marine mammal research now, like the young researchers will probably end up doing that as long as the funding or the institutional backing or, you know, no, no office harassing them continues, right? And respect, like everybody should be given respect. Whatever work has been done needs to be given respect. Yes, it needs to be put into a bigger structure now. So we, we, my only thing is though that it shouldn't be like a national program. It needs to be university level programs, you know. It shouldn't become a thing of status. If it's one NGO, if it's one institution that does marine mammal research, you know, it then becomes a very, it becomes a click. So it, it needs to be spread out over the country. You know? uh, that is what I would suggest. And of course, as, I mean, I was hoping our meeting would happen and we'd have, we'd have the ability to fill those gaps in all the different states. So at least the states we know are important or we have research bases already. You know? So if you start working from Maharashtra or you start working from uh, Karnataka, you know, these are places where you can build from and then spread that idea across the it works. So I agree with you, it's very much important. But, but but it requires universities to start having these people in their labs. Yeah. You know? I mean, everybody wants to do applied sciences. Everybody wants to do ecology, but I wants to do applied ecology. You know, so it's it's very it's not easy to do this level of work, the one that we are doing. What um, the Rika and Vardhan, what you are doing? So I think that um, you know, if you want to look at uh, continuity. Um, I think uh, it becomes a little difficult when you're an independent researcher to you know, see continuity in a project. So I would think that you may start off as an independent researcher, but eventually I think it's it's a good idea to house it in um, in an institute because you, you see along the way, there are several things that you would require, that the institutional supports that you will require to build up on a, on, on a program. And having built up on a program, it need not necessarily eventually just be the program of an institute. After you have, uh, you know, houses in a particular institute, it's then when you can have these collaborations. Like some of the uh, projects that we're recently working on, where we are having like a whole, uh, you know, long-term monitoring program that's being, uh, it's like a collaborative work between several institutes. But it's a long-term monitoring program in the marine uh, system that is, uh, you know, that's just begun uh, sometime last month. So I think um, one is you need to have this institutional support and then you need to have these collaborations if you want to have a, a, a longer a term, a, you know, future for a particular project or a particular study or research or conservation effort. So yeah, also I just wanted to remind you there are several questions here in the Q&A. So we can uh, also look at that after maybe Vardhan's done answering this part of the question. Yeah. Oh, I think even uh, yeah, Anant is back. So once Vardhan is done, we can ask Anant. Yeah. Start so I just uh, I think you guys both covered uh, what I had to say, but I just want to say give a one word answer that is inclusiveness. Uh, that what we need is inclusiveness. So irrespective of which institute, because many times if there are, if the projects are with CMFRI, CMLRE, or some large institute. If you want to work and access uh, their uh, facilities, or uh, then you need to uh, go through the procedure, bureaucratic procedure, and that is often difficult. So if you have inclusiveness, which is incorporated within any institute which which is conducting or doing research, then that is, I think, very good way to go about it. And uh, 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 otherwise, if you want to build program, Elrika mentioned about long-term ecological program. If that is the main thing, the way I see is it gives you financial stability and uh, uh, the funding is for now it's for five years and then there are plans to extend as long as MOEF can so if you have that kind of funding that really helps so uh, uh, even individuals and institutes should while they can uh, do because raising money for uh, one year study is very easy it's very difficult to raise salary it's very difficult to actually sustain. And you can get some money to do work and you'll get good data, it'll be very 
happy as well but then perhaps when you want to build program i think you need to look at salary of everyone and if you and that is something good to consider and if you want to do that what is uh, your uh, your you need to have very good financial model which will sustain and which will back up all your activities so and so yeah so one word answer is inclusiveness yeah, I uh, I, I, um, thank you. Yes. We could join actually. There is a problem with the BSNL in India. There are those mistakes. So we call as a signal. Uh, uh, thank you very much for continuing that. Uh, coming to that particular research thing which I lost, I would like to mention here to everybody that there is a national mission on biodiversity. Uh, there is a, a group of scientists. Uh, there are group of institutions. Uh, focusing on the mainly on a research and collecting a lot of data and then fill all the gaps with respect to biodiversity in india uh, very unfortunate that uh, i failed to convince the team to uh, include the marine biodiversity part of the biodiversity mission that is a very unfortunate this is what lack of awareness i'm telling you it is not that the policy maker or a decision maker or bureaucrat system are problem even our own research community doesn't have much understanding somebody working on a certain subject uh, they give a short giving attention to that only they start arguing for that is only important others are not important so then i was told that though, there is a many program on the ocean maybe that program will take care of the marine biodiversity and we don't want it but it's a different uh, for example there is a national mission on himalaya there is a national mission on climate change mission on uh, ganga everybody talk about biodiversity but still we have a national mission on biodiversity is worth up 6000 crore rupees is not a small amount so such a big program when you are launching as vardhan just now mention about the inclusiveness unfortunately that inclusiveness policy not practiced by uni research community i'm i'm really disappointed because uh, as eldrika was you know telling I, i i really saddened to see listen from such a young researcher saying that raising a fund is a difficult in the marine system we need a more fund and all but this kind of national mission can help us very unfortunate that uh, that national mission not included the marine biodiversity as part of the national mission but one good news is i can tell that there are some discussion on the improving the blue economy uh, in the country when we are the blue economy it talks about the sustainable management of fishery resources and also take care of the research on the rare animals also hopefully we may get some support from there and then further the project dolphin which uh, the government recently launched and uh, trying to build uh, some you know, big research component and but again there are many organizations working on it vardhan rightly mentioned earlier also uh, there was a first international conference and the coral reef was took place in, in india we should be proud of that so that means that a lot of attention was given that time unfortunately we couldn't update those things and we have a scientist in researcher updated researcher unfortunately they are not getting enough logistic support i think awareness i agree with dr midula and dibani also uh, now that kind of uh, feeling is there with the people in india and now everybody started talking about a marine biodiversity at least now at least talking hopefully it will reach into the field and the conservation that uh, i stop here maybe we can continue the panel discussion yeah uh i'm sorry uh, there was uh, an internet breakdown here so internet uh, breakdown is also one of the problem affecting marine mammal conservation in india i guess uh, <laughs> i have uh, the questions uh, sorry uh, na, we missed that part but i think a lot of questions were taken up uh, when we were not there but uh, still there are some questions coming up uh, from our attendees i'll uh, take those questions one by one and uh, just a minute so there is one question to i think all of the panelists uh, how do you think eco tourism will help in conservation of marine mammals in india uh, uh, any of the panelists would like to comment on that uh, eco tourism uh, maybe others members also can help me in that uh, what i feeling is eco tourism we have to do that uh, because Uh, it is the incentives for the conservation people should get a benefit you know the one benefit will get it through eco tourism only thing is how to do eco tourism uh, that's what we have to be very careful uh, in the name of uh, eco tourism we should not start uh, you know, doing some harmful to that uh, animal or a system as such 
uh, but again in the recent meeting dr dibani was there very well in the iwc discussion on the whale watching program uh, after a lot of research the expert came up with the what would be the safest distance one can approach the whales or a dolphins how close we can approach us uh, so again the science should guide uh, developing a better ecotourism plan in the marine system in, in india we may not in a position to take uh, you know example from other country because the situation is totally different there but in our country probably we have to again take the help of the science and the research to come up with a better plan for ecotourism but i agree we should go for ecotourism because this is the one way uh, we can actually uh, talk about the sustainable management of the resources the marine resources uh, ecotourism could be the uh, better option in that so maybe other panels can help me better any thoughts on this uh, dipani so it's a double edged sword no um, and again uh, you know in india we, we all know that there are very few actually eco tourist locations uh, and it's a, it's probably a, it's a problem we've had a very good i don't know somebody's mic somebody's uh, something is on i don't know so in in andaman nicobar when we held a meeting the ima meeting with all the different stakeholders starting from ferry drivers to a port authority and navy and everybody had come for that meeting uh, it, it was a very interesting thing that the pcc have brought about about you know um, high end low end tourism you know eco tourism is usually if you are doing it in peninsula india and the islands it's still different peninsula india eco tourism is usually considered high end because you want to give good quality experience and for that they it costs a lot so what about all our masses we have the right to experience dolphins and whales and reefs also so why should we not be able to provide for them you know so that was his argument towards us saying let's raise our uh, prices for things so that there are low number of people going out at the same time so that our system is protected that's a logical way of doing it and it still is but i can give you the 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 chilka example because that's what i know best Uh, um in goa i know goa is so much better than chilka i'm talking only about dolphin watching um but the thing about Chil- chilka is that we don't have outboard engines right we don't have um, the only problem we have there is that number of people to going out at the same time are very high so if and so so we have to manage somewhere we will need a top down approach if your ultimate goal is not eco- just economy but also sustaining what is providing the economy um so we have to be very careful i think a management plan we don't have one of the biggest problems again rudula you might know in india we don't have anything uh, any we we have we, we have guidelines for tiger national parks for tigers and elephants as to how tourism should be done there but we don't have any guidelines for the marine areas uh we don't have in goa uh, uh terra conscious puja cannot go and tell the tourism minister that you need to have a management plan there is no like, there's not there's nothing in the legal structure that can actually tell boat people or divers that you're not supposed to do this and support not you can do this and not supposed to do this it's only the wildlife pcf who can say something the tourism doesn't take responsibility for being ecologically sensitive the tourism sector so if you want to do eco tourism it's not us you need to really knock on you need to knock on the tourism ministry and the in the commerce ministry they are the ones who are um, we have the information they are not ready to accept it or utilize it to manage well so that's what i would say <clears throat> dipani there is some other question for you from pradeep over here i see it in the q and a says uh, from childhood i observe so many fishing activities around me and observe many times humpback dolphins when we are going fishing with my family lack of knowledge and research in the local language may be one of the biggest reasons in our country to create research or interest in young, in young minds can you tell us what it is what is your opinion about this i have a very very strong opinion about this in fact i've had my own peers tell me why are you saying this why are you saying this but from the time we've started all of us i think at least the ones who are here we like to take our interns our volunteers our technical help from local areas because we believe i mean 
we don't need to get into the geopolitics of language in our country but for communication we need people who are speaking the same language because when you speak the lang the same language you build trust you build uh, you know people understand you better uh, so at least when we do wherever we do work we um, we only want to want to take people who speak that local language uh, and then when we this most of our teams um, give give the information back to the local communities and we do that also in the local language uh, so so as i said even earlier you may have heard that every state needs to develop in its university its own labs it's the only way of getting people involved in this research so uh, in Ker for for example in kerala in trivandrum university you know i have given talks over there uh, there are people interested they, they, the students come out in the field with me also um, and but i only let them the students do the talking with the fishermen i only let the students do the interview surveys with the fishermen or with anybody else so i think this is the way whenever we go to work we need to involve the local students in the research uh, in orissa you use you ask odia people to do research so i think it is very very important that uh, we involve uh, people speaking the same language Okay. Uh, thank you, Dipani. And we have a question from Vishal. Tell us more about the these models the guidelines, rather than just doing them. We can't hear you very well. And some somebody's wall. Hello. Forgot to unmute themselves. Can you hear? Uh, can you hear me? Not very clearly. Okay. <laughs> I think we can we just read the questions from the Q and A directly if there's a yeah please help me Anand Anand please. could you please tell uh, uh, participants to unmute their uh, mic because we can hear someone talking in the back no participants participants are already muted uh, it's only the panelists uh, which are uh, not muted uh, can you hear me now uh, clearly or yeah. am I still breaking it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. So now I'll it's ask, better. Anand. I'll ask the question again. It's to Dr. Mridula Shrinivasan. Could you tell us more about how the MMPA is more based on scientific guidelines rather than just do's and don'ts? So I think you're, uh, you're talking about the Marine Mammal Protection Act. Um, so the the Marine Mammal Protection Act um, has a goal, the conservation goal. Of protecting all marine mammals, both domestically and internationally. When I say scientific guidelines, it, it essentially says um, how we should assess or study our marine mammals. Um, and it gives us, uh, there are different sections of the Marine Mammal Protection Act that talk about um, what aspects of marine mammals that are important, the biology, the ecology, um, understanding population dynamics, understanding how they function in the ecosystem. It's one of the few, I think, again, uh, legislations that puts marine mammals within an ecosystem context. And I think that's very important as well. Um, increasingly, um, and I think uh, in the past, um, a lot of the work that has been done has been very marine mammal focused. And we tend to just focus on the species, species behavior and biology. But I think um, given the conservation problems we have now, uh, the sort of place-based or threat-based studies are, are becoming increasingly important. So marine mammals have to be seen as part of the ecosystem uh, rather than in isolation. Um, and so the Marine Mammal Protection Act did that really well. Um, and it also tells us that we have to it is required, statutorily, we are required to assess the populations of marine mammals. Um, and we have um, a conservation units that are designated as stocks. Um, and um, I won't go into the definition, but essentially we have these conservation units or stocks that we have to study um, in terms of estimating abundance, um, understanding distribution um, and um, understanding the life history, um, understanding the mortality of, uh, of these stocks wherever they occur within the US EEZ. Um, and so because we have that in the act, NOAA, um, which implements the Marine Mammal Protection Act, as well as our um, sister agency, the US Fish and Wildlife, um, we are required by law 
to study these marine mammals and get the, the relevant assessment data. Whether we're able to do it or not um, is, is a different question. We, we have done made significant strides, but there's still a lot of things we don't know. Um, and I know a lot of people here talked about, you know, bureaucratic issues and um, different ministries and things like that. We have the same issue. NOAA is, um, uh, we don't study all marine mammals. Um, you have fish and wildlife where manatees, uh, dugongs, uh, manatees, uh, polar bears and walrus fall under, as well as sea otters, which we are not responsible for. We are only responsible for sort of the marine species. Um, and, and so there is that two ministries that are operating, um, as well as this tremendous amount of bureaucracy. I mean, everywhere you go, we have bureaucracy. The only thing is that there are some established structures and institutions and regulations, uh, but it, it's not perfect. But it is definitely a great way to build a program around having the, the science. One of the, I think another good thing about NOAA and in terms of implementation of the MMPA is both the science and management uh, components or um, parts of the agency are housed together. Unlike in fish and wildlife, where they, the science part of the agency is um, undertaken by USGS, US um, United States Geological Survey, whereas the management or regulatory aspect is covered by US Fish and Wildlife uh, to a large extent. In NOAA, both the regulatory and the science um, are together, they're housed together which is I think really great because that allows that conservation element to rise to the top um, and allows us to more effectively implement the law, whether it's the Marine Mammal Protection Act, the Endangered Species Act, or every other you know, uh, statute that's um, important. I guess I'll end there. Thank you, Mridula. Uh, we have another question coming up uh, for all the panelists, and I think this particularly can be taken up by Mridula. Uh, is it possible to take a program on marine mammals and uh, what are the firm platforms uh, to uh, take up a PhD program? I mean, uh, did you get a question or shall I ask again? Could you ask it again? <laughs> okay, so Arun is asking, is it possible to take up PhD programs on marine mammals? Uh, in India? or elsewhere? I think I think anywhere in the world, I think. Yeah. Yes, yes, the short answer is yes. Um, in India, it's harder. Um, obviously, I mean, a lot of us, uh, so I did my master's here in um, University of Delhi, and that, that, that was um, almost 20 years ago now, I'm, um, but there was just no scope for doing marine biology, marine ecology, or marine mammal science. Uh, and it was pretty demoralizing. I had a very demoralizing education, I have to say. It was very hard, so I had to look for greener pastures at that time. Um, and like Dipani, I didn't have really good mentors <laughs> when I was in the University of Delhi. It was it was real struggle. Um, however, there are institutions that do offer PhD programs and the United States definitely has a lot more PhD programs, but the competition is very, very severe. Um, I remember that even applying for master's or PhD, um, it's like you have one PhD position among maybe 50 or 100 applications. So it gets really, really tough, even in the US with all the universities that potentially offer marine mammal science. There are not that many, but they, what, whichever universities that do offer marine mammal science, um, they, they are very competitive. Um, I will say that increasingly, um, which I think the Pani mentioned early on, is the whole interdisciplinary way of looking at things now. It's all about skill acquisition. Um, there was a time where it was all about understanding, working with marine mammals, studying their behavior, studying the ecology. And I think that's incredibly important. You have to go out, get that experience, work with these animals, study them in the wild to have a really good appreciation and develop that passion. Uh, but when it comes to PhD admissions and um, uh, whether it's in the US or UK or Europe or um, in Australia, New Zealand, they're really looking for transferable skills. So whether you have statistical uh, background, whether you know programming languages, whether you know GIS, whether you happen to be an engineer, um, all of those are very important skills, whether you're a veterinarian, um, you know, a veterinarian or a, a health professional um, or a toxicologist or an endocrinologist, all of these 
disciplines are equally important. So it doesn't mean that you have to have a marine mammal background to study marine mammals. Increasingly, uh, there is a lot of interdisciplinary or cross-pollination that's happening. And the more diverse and unique you are, the more diverse your skill set and more unique you are, the more chances you have in, in securing admission. The other problem right now, I think, is funding. I mean, everywhere you go, you just don't have the funding to support your education. And, um, and that's, that's a problem. Uh, but still, if you want to get admission, I think um, if you focus on developing skills, gaining experience, you stand a better chance than not having those skills. Um, and that I think will really improve your uh, ability. Uh, the, I guess in India, it's still a problem, but doesn't matter if you don't do a marine mammal science in a PhD. I think even if you do molecular biology or genetics or microbiology, I think it's incredibly important and equally vital. So I, I always tell students that don't feel disheartened or demoralized just because you did zoology or, you know, you you did computer science and you, your passion is for marine mammals or marine sciences, you still can make a career. We need that interdisciplinary blood in, um, in marine mammal science. Um, for the longest time, it was a very, I, I think the sea turtle and seabird community are far more uh, inclusive and uh, more diverse compared to the marine mammal uh, field. It's always been a little more elitist but things are changing. And I think with people coming from different backgrounds, um, it will definitely make, make a huge difference. And I think in India, that's really critical. We have amazing talent um, and highly qualified people, but they're always like sort of stonewalled in, uh, in what they specialize in. So if somebody is an engineer, they're like, I will only do mechanical engineering and then get an MBA and then you know feel horrible and miserable, even though my passion is marine science. So people need to open up their horizon and think there are other ways to study marine mammals and support marine mammal conservation. Thank you, Maridula. Uh, we have another question coming from Sopnali, a rather tricky question to all of the panelists. Uh, do we acknowledge that there is an underlying bias in terms of encouraged networking and collaborative efforts in marine research in India? So when we, so when we say collaboration, do we really mean collaboration? Because in the end, whether government, NGO, or an independent researcher, are we not all fighting for the same cause? Uh, Shiva, sir, do you have any thoughts on this? Uh, I think it's not, uh, he's not able to hear me. Uh, uh, Vardhan and Elrika, you can also pitch in if you want to answer this question. Uh, about collaborative. Okay, Dipani is raising her hand. Okay, Dipani, go ahead, please. So I'm going to reread the question in benefit of doubt for everyone. So um, do we acknowledge that there is an underlying bias in terms of encouragement, networking, and collaborative efforts in marine research in India? This bit. So I let's go back a bit in history. When did marine research really like, when we talk about marine research, we talk about ecological research. At least I'm talking about ecological. When did it start? It's very recent, you know, it's Nature Conservation Foundation really who started good quality marine research, according to me in India. Uh, the others have been doing things like doing uh, collections and doing you know, listing species. Uh, that's the beginning. I'm not going to put that down. Uh, and so when somebody, when again, this takes me back to the point about how we should not centralize these, centralize these things, that everybody needs to have labs in different states and everybody's equal. But when they started out, they started out small. And sometimes when you start out small and you put a lot of energy and effort into a student and you're building that student up as a scientist, you know, I think it is looked at as, oh, they are not including us. But you have to look at the effort and the mind and the amount of energy, mind energy that people put into their students. So people who choose students, they're not, they're not saying no to the whole world. They're, when people, when we choose students, we choose students based on certain set of skills as uh, what, her, what Rudula just said, you know, that you need to have certain set of skills. You need to be able to communicate in a certain way for people to want to put energy into it. Or you have to prepare yourself for that. You don't have to be put down if you feel like you're being let out or let, you know, left out, then speak up. And if it's possible, if our lab, uh, you know, if people's frequencies match, if people's questions match, 
uh, then then there is collaboration. But of course, there's another kind of collaboration where there's open data sharing, like the humpback whale research. You know, I I'm not signed an MOU. Most people across the sea know that I'm going to give all the data to them if they need it and when they need it. So there is a, when you say when you say that uh, there is a bias, I don't completely agree in what that bias could stand for. But yes, there needs to be the shift from small organizations, elitist organizations, to a university level public uh, involvement if it's available. Um, so that is one thing, and so that so I do think that there is good collaboration. Then of course there are things that don't go well sometimes, and you do have fallouts with people. I've had a fallout with persons with people because then they, because sometimes these are individual level things. But I don't think we can generalize that there is a bias in encouragement and networking. Um, and uh, and in fact, otherwise I would say that a lot of money is just going into Kampa right now, isn't it? Let's just be honest if that's the question. So much money is going into Kampa while a lot of others are not getting any money. So then uh, we can also say the same, but we don't. We are all just sitting here, no? So uh, I think as, as Sivasar said earlier, we are all together. As Vardhan said, we are all together over here. Uh, and that just shows that we are actually being, in, we are including everybody and not biased towards anybody. Uh, hopefully ZSI, BS, all the others are also listening in, same FRI. I always include same FRI in all our presentations because that's where we all started from. But, uh, but do they do the return? <laughs> Should I ask that question now that you've asked this? You know, it's, it needs to be both ways. It needs to be both ways. Um, so that was my answer to that. Uh, Vardhan, you want to say something? Anybody wants to pitch in? So, so, uh, I agree and I disagree uh, to what the uh, what the question is. Uh, I agree that do we acknowledge? So the answer is yes, we do acknowledge. And uh, even in, uh, when I was giving my bit, I was saying of I was talking about inclusiveness and I was uh, I was talking about recognizing or acknowledging that we do have different viewpoints. And as Dipani mentioned, that many times th there are two individuals who have different wavelengths, different um, way of thinking, different way of processing their data, different ethics, background, morals. Many times these things don't match. And then it comes across that you are being, you are not supportive, you are not encouraging, you are being a difficult person as a peer or as to work with. But sometimes that's not true. It's just uh, how we are structured. So I think the uh, the uh, the question is really good because well, the question is: Do we acknowledge? Yes, we do acknowledge that there is a gap, and we want to We do recognize. We acknowledge, and that's why, and we recognize, and that's why we want to work towards it. And this conference is very good example where everyone is talking, and which where there are people from different background who are working together. Uh, towards same cause and that's what your second part of the question is because in the end whether government and your independent are we not all fighting for the same cause totally agree we acknowledge that part but the first part is that sometimes it's difficult and uh, perhaps uh, what i would like to say is that if we can uh, come up with a mechanism or uh, or a process of how we can work or if there is an institute which has uh, for example, for marine mammal research, you require certain uh, equipments. You re require big kind of binoculars. You require big boat, big ship. And if there's a mechanism where you can access, uh, and if this mechanism is worked out, or if some organization has funding, and if there is a, there is a process where someone can apply, for example, Mangrove Foundation, they have money. They have uh, uh, the good corpus. But they advertise on the website that, for any researchers, we can give money up to so and so. All you need to do is this is a format, send an application, and as a young researcher, you will. So if this is a, a one way that they have come up with. So if different institutes have a mechanism in place where uh, uh, people can work together and people can be included, then I think that will be really good. And uh, that could be, that's the way I see that, how we can work together for common cause, as you mentioned. So, Okay, thank you, uh, Vardhan. Uh, we have a question now from uh, Rohit coming up. Uh, he's asking, the mangrove cell of Maharashtra Forest Department seem to have a, seems to have given a fillip to coastal biodiversity conservation there. 
they also act as an umbrella government administrative unit that welcomes and even funds in limited ways various kinds of researchers slash organizations slash civil society members quite inclusive do other state forest departments along the coast have similar dedicated coastal administrative units would such state wide units help uh, i don't think we have shiva sir here right now yeah yeah that i am here okay. anand i joined in your id now uh, okay. uh, thanks rogit uh, uh, thanks rogit actually the model is initiated from odisha actually that was a used to be a mangrove division separate division created by odisha was the first state to given first attention to this uh, then uh, mangrove maharashtra government actually uh, they made it more advanced Uh, they made it as a state level, and uh, they are doing really extremely good. In fact, we have been uh, projecting this model to elsewhere in India, and uh, that also helped us to you know put this point in National Wildlife Action Plan. In the current National Wildlife Action Plan, uh, emphasizes the importance of having an exclusive cell for marine system in all the states in the chief wildlife garden, and also we given that uh, some kind of advisory that. At least, it additional pieces here that a senior forest office should have that mang, uh, marine meadows. It's a mang, it's a marine busty uh, sail in each coastal state and union territory. And I must say that the Karnataka government was the first state uh, to implement this part actually. So they established a, ma- a marine biodiversity committee and then the marine biodiversity division there, and uh, it's yet to function. The constituted committee. Uh, they notified it but it has to take uh, start working in the field i hopefully that many state will come forward to do, do that and of course uh, maharashtra mangrove cell now the mangrove cell also renamed as uh, uh, included the entire spectrum of the marine biodiversity into that they renamed it so now uh, it's a good model and many states are coming up and they will do it thank you Uh, thank you sir everybody uh, i'll just go ahead with this next question here um, paul is asking uh, recently there has been news coming out that uh, there is a big tourism development program in the lakshadweep which i think is a sensitive ecosystem that inhabits coral reefs seagrass turtle nesting sites and bird sanctuary in the pitti islands how do you think such tourism development on sensitive ecosystems would actually sustain them on a long term environment and forest Recognize fragility of habitats and ecosystems. Uh, so, do you want to answer uh, this? Uh, regarding the questions. second part of our questions, uh, I don't think so. Our panelist can answer you whether the developments accepted, approved by the Ministry of Environment or not. Uh, we are not part of that uh, things. But coming to the first part of the questions, which uh, Dr. Devani also said, the two-edged sword actually. although i uh, support the ecotourism uh, because as long as it's benefit to the local community help the livelihood of the local uh, stakeholders especially fishermen community i support but again while support this and i don't want to for a tourism which is harmful to the system at all what, what that's what uh, we have guidelines universal guidelines we have a, some global model and all and now we have to adopt that model in, in india and then come up with a better plan to risk management plan in the coastal and marine system and then implement it in a, a whole holy that's also important but since this asked i can tell one thing that the go of india in fact actually uh, planning for a major tourism uh, things in uh, both the islands and we know the both the islands are really sensitive i started my research from island only and that will nicobar i know how vulnerable those system on but we can't go for blindly that major tourism in this island we have to cope with it cautiously and uh, i hope it will be done it in uh, using our science uh, information we have it but if the government not sending us a different things but again if we i can tell that let it come forward to action hello uh, i can't hear uh, shiva sir we lost okay 
Okay, we'll go to the next question. Uh, once he comes back and resume. Uh, it's, uh, next question is, uh, can we build a national awareness program among fishermen and other stakeholders participating in fisheries department, MPDA, CMFRI, WII, and NGOs? Uh, anybody wants to uh, address this question? Yeah, awareness is important. It's a key. In fact, our experience working with the Dugong also shows that creating awareness is key. But uh, normally, we, the, we used to think that only the local people, uh, fishermen community, they need awareness. Not like that. Everybody needs awareness. I think uh, some of the panel members also earlier said that everybody, top to bottom, uh, that awareness should be created, that awareness required for even a scientific community. And I could see this is a, a classic example when we lost, the host lost the signal, but some of the panel member took over. Uh, thanks to all of you. This is what the team spirit, we need it. And uh, such kind of spirit required, especially in the marine system. We can't work alone. And uh, that awareness needs to be given to research organization. 127 institutions working in marine system in, in India. It is not a smaller number, the 127 institution. So, but majority of them they don't see the others count. That is the first part. So we have created our among this institution, awareness among to the base system, awareness among the policy makers, and uh, of course awareness among the other stakeholders, fishermen communities. Record, I agree with you. Awareness is that we need to. Do. Okay, uh, thank you, so sir. I can uh, uh, answer question, one uh, more, if I could add, Anand. Yeah. Um, I think, you yeah, know, please, please. one thing that's important um, when it comes to awareness and education outreach, you have to start early. Um, I think, you know, in schools, um, when you start in middle school or junior school, or high school, kids need to be made aware of marine issues and marine conservation. I think if you don't attract them early enough, then there is no, it's very difficult to create awareness or appreciation or concern or care. You know, the fundamental thing for conservation is empathy. Um, and you need to be empathetic about animals and the environment. And a lot of that awareness is built very early on. So I think it's very, very important that in our education system, we focus on kids at a very early age. Um, I've found that um, also we have to make sure that the education programs cater to all students, right? Not just to the English speaking schools that have the ability, the resources to go and even think about going on a whale watch or a dolphin uh, watch program or go travel internationally. You want um, the average student to have that exposure. It's only when you have exposure that you develop interest that leads to passion, which leads to concern. And then therefore, if you're really inclined, then you will pursue a higher education and uh, get become a professional. So it's, it's very important, I think, uh, that we target students in an early age. And I also agree with Dr. Shiv Kumar about awareness has to happen at all levels. It's not just at you know, we just have to do fishermen out here. I think the fishermen are very knowledgeable. I think we can learn a lot more from them. Um, and um, I think it's really about um, at all levels, not just the fishermen. Somebody wants to read the next question. I think we are missing both of them. <laughs> Oh, I'm there. I'm there. Ah, great, Anand. That's nice. <laughs> uh, so we have a question coming from. He spoke too soon. Yeah. <laughs> I'll Go read ahead. the same question because I think it's been up there in that list. Yeah. Uh, says how how has societal change affected research and conservation perspectives in a country, or how does societal changes affect how do societal changes affect research and conservation perspectives in a country? Societal changes meaning uh, what kind of societal changes? You mean, social, sure. you mean coming up economically, being able to access resources? Uh, I don't know. 
and being able to access Chinmaya, TV. Sorry, Chinmaya, you can elaborate on that question and type it down, and we can take it later. Um, the next question is about how can citizens get involved on this on the on their own steam without being part of any organization or having a marine mammal background. Yeah, we kind of answered that, no, all of us, that experience go out and become, yeah, yeah? but then go ahead. Yeah, I didn't know that this question is being answered. But. Okay, there's another one which says, what kind of laws or responsibilities lie with the Coast Guard and other authorities with respect to release of plastic and garbage pollution into the oceans? Anyone wants to answer? I wanted that? to go back to the previous question, Dalrika, and Which I think one? it's connected to this is there's self responsibility. You know, um, that is something we, we sorely lack as a society. Um, you know, societal change, going back to the issue of societal change, you know, everybody's about recycling now, reusing, and all of that. It's because it's a fad. Uh, but at the same time, because of social media and because of this sort of peer pressure, it, it does impact on uh, people now having an understanding that plast marine debris has an impact on uh, marine animals. Um, you know, don't release balloons uh, during a happy birthday or anniversary and uh, make, because those balloons will end up at, in the ocean consumed by a shark or a sea turtle or shark. So there is that effect of uh, society becoming more aware and more educated. And I think it's very important that people Take education seriously. You know, don't just consume the the Insta bite, the Instagram or Twitter bite, but uh, learn more. Uh, go in things in depth and learn more about it. So then you understand the full picture rather than just focusing on what is attractive uh, today. I think that's the the folly of mankind. The second thing is self responsibility. Um, you know, we are very quick to say the government should do this, the government should do that but individual responsibility sometimes is sorely lacking. Um, when you've traveled with your family, does somebody in your family throw something out? You know, whether it's plastic or a paper or something, do you litter? Are you aware of where, what you're putting into your garbage or how it's being used or what that chain uh, looks like? So I think it, it, there's it's self responsibility is equally important, not just government responsibility. So Chinmaya has elaborated on that question, saying uh, societal change actually in, including economical and political changes. So how do these affect research and conservation in the country? Anyone wants to answer? It's a huge, <laughs> it's a huge topic. <laughs> um, but the easiest, I mean, just butt in anybody who wants to speak when I'm speaking, is that the easiest answer would be that, of course, when economical changes, you have more access to resources, you are... Uh, no, I don't mean this phone mobile based resources. I'm talking about actually being able to uh, experience more so that you know more about what you like, what you don't like, what you want to question and not question, you know, get out of your comfort zones or get out of your homes, your cities, travel. So, of course, that would bring about a change. It's very much connected again to what Mudula was also saying. Uh, political changes, uh, sadly, in our country, I don't even know how to answer that because we have this uh, inbuilt mechanism that we will undo what the last government did, you know. Um, so if the if a Maharashtra, if I mean, I'm, I don't really want to say all this, but right now Maharashtra is the jewel in our country when it comes to comes to at least Bombay and the things that are being said by the current env new environment minister in Maharashtra. So, uh, but, but, um, but uh, so politics is very, very difficult to answer that question. It's very complex. Uh, and hopefully we will be able to separate politics from environment. Uh, decision making, huh? I'm saying environmental decision making, being able to follow the laws of the land when it comes to environmental protection, no matter what political agenda you might have. Uh, I think, I wish people would do that. Anybody else wants to put in? I, yeah, uh, I just, I agree with the Dibani. In fact, just here also may not be in a position to answer uh, that. Vardhan, you want to say something? Yes, go ahead, Vardhan. No, I was uh, just saying that when you talk about societal change and uh, uh, 
how it's going to impact research and conservation perspective in a country i think uh, the question if it's uh, it's very difficult to answer this at a country level you can talk about and dipani also gave example of maharashtra so this is you have to uh, scale it down to say regional level and societal change is it's a when you talk about there are some societies such as island communities they are homogeneous communities and when there is societal change at that level it impacts the entire island the entire group and that clan i and i think uh, if you scale it down then the and if you look at from that perspective there are uh, from um, uh, tragedy of commons and from how that had been documented to uh, what uh, ostrom has spoken that uh, there is uh, very well good there is good documentation of institution failure there is a good documentation of how uh, common property resources are being misused and uh, uh, why i am bringing this is because uh, if there is a drastic societal change such as if they for example in the nicobars when there was a tsunami uh, there was a big societal change for those community and that had huge consequences on the way they looked at the environment uh similarly uh, when there is a huge political change in uh, decision making or government policies that directly has influences the way we do conservation or the way it impacts conservation as well so i think uh, you know, if you scale it down i think that is uh, useful and that is uh, uh, good to good way to look at it and if you as a researcher as a conservationist if you are working in a particular region for example chilka and then if you look at the uh, socio political environment in of that place and if you try to understand that and then uh, work towards changing it or towards working with the system i think that's a very good way to go about it uh, because uh, uh, at the at the end of the day individuals matter and it's uh, it's the changes happen at individual by, or they are derived by individuals and if you understand what is happening in your surrounding and mrudal also mentioned that if you take responsibility uh, if you are if you educate uh, uh, yourself about what kind of changes that are happening in your environment i think that is really useful certainly a very interesting question yeah definitely <laughs> lots of things going on in the head but we can't cover it all just now uh, okay that is another question uh, from mr paul uh, Paul, there is no dugong reported uh, like Chetiv in the recent past. I don't think so. We have dugong there. Uh, then there is a one more question about the microplastic in marine mammal. Uh, I don't think so. We have done much study. There are I heard that there are somebody working on the Gangetic dolphin microplastic. Dipan, uh, do you know anything about microplastic study in marine mammal in India? No, not microplastics. No, not yet. At least not that I know yeah. of. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We've just managed. We just managed to probably necropsy one okay. percent of the animals that we find. So. Yeah. So we found some like a not a plastic inside the kind of gong as as both in of Manalis and Gujarat. Uh, probably because they feed on the sea grass, which is mixed with some native fragments. so they must have ingested those things that's what but uh, this is a study microplastic contamination in the tissues i don't think so we have done any study in, in india uh, probably uh, some new researcher can take up uh, that's one thing provided we get a permission on the sample that's one thing and there's a one question for uh, dr varudan uh, again mr paul asking that giving something some of the best marine conservation programs are found in the southeast asian country uh, due to the coral triangle those strategy resolve around the concept of a decentralized method of action as opposed to centralized one uh, that is predominant in india how feasible it is to accept and implement a decentralized mode of action for resource conservation in india what then well, your mic yeah, ah. sorry yes 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 sorry uh, yeah i'll just read this question for my own clarity which is uh, the last part which is how feasible it is to accept and implement this decentralized mode of action for resource conservation uh, in india uh, paul you are you are right that in um, coral triangle in and in many countries in southeast asia uh, uh, there are the models or there are very good example of this centralized system uh, in india uh, 
uh, unfortunately and correct the specific of correct me if i'm wrong that uh, wildlife protection act is uh, uh, is the law that we uh, use for protecting uh, our marine uh, uh, animals and uh, which is and we have marine protected area which is a very centralized structured top down approach for conservation and perhaps uh, uh, when you talk about decentralization it's important that you actually uh, uh, think about community conservation models uh, while there is and currently in india there is only one community conservation uh, reserve in kerala uh, so uh, the question is that how feasible it is possible it is do totally feasible it is possible to work but then the our system uh, is according to me it's uh, the the structure is that uh, uh, forest department is primary custodian of uh, all marine and of, uh, of, of all marine resources and marine animals and often they there is limited knowledge uh, and uh, as everyone mentioned that there is very limited awareness uh, about marine mammals and about marine biodiversity in general so uh, one way to go about it is that maybe work it out or have a different section of how to or again mechanism to have a system or of decentralization and if we do that then i think we would that that is possible to do it and then we can work but our bottoms up approach is really works and uh, getting people on board uh, would really help so that's my take on it Yeah. So uh, then there's a question. Ask. I think panel might have answered this earlier. Uh, Miss Neel Rana, she would like to know that how the climate change and uh, water pollution can maybe uh, okay with last year. Uh, what about Dr. Tiwani? would you answer that they're asking that how the climate change and the water pollution can affect the marine mammals uh dibani you are you have to unmute your mic so uh, pollution of course is something that can be done but we are not doing enough of it because uh, you know as everybody else over here on the panel knows we don't have a we have networks informing you about dead animals getting stranded or anything but we don't really have the next steps in place where we can actually collect those tissue samples and uh, test them for um, toxicity and then relate it to the environment uh, influence that might be released in the environment and so on and so forth it's a huge huge it's it's like a, a treasure waiting to be opened you know because we have in terrible industries all along the west coast at least of india uh so it's it, it there are lots of phd's sitting right there to be done uh i think there has been a study done in chilkon iravadi dolphins looking at the release of agricultural pollutants into the into the lake it's an old study that person has left the country because he got fed up and he, i think he's somewhere in the middle east in one of the universities now uh, but at least he tried to do that work and i think there's some da work done on platanista both river ayn and uh, laguna we haven't done any work of this nature on uh, coastal or marine cetaceans yet when it comes to poll pollutants toxicity levels we only have information on uh, plastics being found uh, during necropsies when it comes to climate change uh, it's such a huge thing i i, I would ask rudolph actually to help with this because noah does a lot of this work uh, at least i've started doing uh, some of this work where they are modeling changes in the arabian sea i just know that oman has a disco program so they are trying to relate the changes in the productivity and the currents related to the currents in the arabian sea to uh, mammal and turtle distributions and i think mahi is taking up something this kind of work in the future in collaboration with oman also uh, using the disco program which is a which is a satellite based uh, analysis of of uh, climate oceanography but um, rudra can you say a few things about the climate change aspect so yeah so much of the climate change impacts on marine mammals has been uh, primarily focused on the arctic species and um, antarctic species uh, because of loss of sea ice which uh, particularly affects ice seals ice associated seals but we're also seeing impacts on bowhead whales and beluga whales um, um and so you have climate winners and climate losers um in particularly in the poles 
but based on the IPCC projections, we know tropical environments are going to be the hardest hit. Um, but from a marine mammal perspective, in terms of the ability to cope with temperature change, it's, it's pretty good. I mean, they, they can tolerate quite a lot of fluctuation in water temperature. Um, so that is not what we think is the primary impact on marine mammals. It's usually indirect, uh, where there is impact on their prey, uh, which is affected by temperature, um, and so, which is primarily sea surface temperature. And so you have prey distributional shifts which in turn has impacts on the predator, which is your marine mammals that uh, are following the prey. So they do get impacted that way. But um, recently NOAA has um, um, done an analogous work or is still working on this is the climate vulnerability uh, analysis. So that is looking at a very broad scale level of what attributes, um, whether it's the sensitivity attributes to climate change or intrinsic attributes of life history um, that may impact marine mammals because of um, changing um, climate uh, over a 50 year period. Um, but I think uh, the climate vulnerability assessment that we did essentially tells what a lot of marine mammal researchers already know in terms of which animals are more likely to be impacted and which less. Uh, we still don't quite understand how climate is going to impact, um, you know, coastal dolphin populations versus pelagic dolphin populations versus migrating whales. So, you know, particularly with males, um, unlike in India, there are whales that are migrating from the poles down to the tropics. And increasingly, we're seeing phenological changes, you know, they are arriving late at the calving grounds, um, or leaving early from the calving grounds and staying very long in the feeding grounds. Um, and this has consequences because, um, Either they have little food to eat or too much food to eat. So they stay there and they're not migrating, only a portion is migrating, but then that puts you in danger with predators, um, particularly killer whales. Uh, in the Arctic, we, we're seeing that killer whales are really some of the climate winners where they are moving into areas which are freed up from ice. So it, it is quite complex. And the problem right now, um, I think in India, and I think in a lot of places is, is the, that there's a lot of things lost in translation. So we have great climate models, we have great oceanographers, we have great climate scientists and a lot of climate data, but that's not at the scale that we need for assessing impacts. And it's not one size fits all for marine mammals. Um, and so you need these downscale climate models and you need the long time series. Uh, it goes back to what I, I think we initially talked about building a program. You need abundance data for at least 10, 20, 50 years so that you can actually map it or correlate it with climate fluctuations. So there are, uh, because we have to separate what is natural impact versus what is anthropogenic climate change impacts. And, and so it's a lot more complex than we think. And so you don't see a lot of studies on climate impact on marine mammals or seabirds. Seabirds, I think you have a lot more information than in marine mammals, that's for sure. But a lack of climate data, oceanographic data, particularly in the Indian um, context is, is, is definitely stymieing that correlation of you know, abundance distribution information with the climate information. Thank you. Uh, in fact, questions for can't hear you. So we cannot hear you. Does anybody want to answer Pradeep's question? What is the best way to develop better skills in marine mammal acoustic studies? I'm a bit tired. <laughs> yeah, I need to get to bed. <laughs> to, <laughs> so um, I would, yeah, go ahead. No, what is the best way to develop better skills in marine mammal acoustic study? I think it, it goes back to... Sorry. Okay. Yeah, with the BNU, there's a problem with the target from... So, uh, that is... Okay. Uh, Okay, Tan, I would listen to us <laughs> that much I can say right now. Uh, we are, I don't know whether we are uh, still on or not. Thank you, a few. Okay, I think we are, are we signing out?
I, I thought so. Okay. I no, I think uh, that... yeah, good to answer the question that you started. No, uh, acoustic. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I guess other people can also answer this, but uh, in my experience, uh, marine mammal bioacoustics is is a very specialized study. Acoustics, bioacoustics itself, is very specialized. So I think it's it's a good idea. Um, to develop some core skills um, in understanding uh, acoustics since ocean acoustics. So if you major in ocean engineering or um, go to a school which spe specializes on sound mechanics and sound communications, it's very important, even if you don't specialize in bioacoustics, uh, because you need to understand sound propagation and uh, um, you need to understand how that would be impacted, particularly in the marine environment. Um, but from a marine mammal perspective, uh, you, you really need to either get a degree in it or you need to work in a lab that has that marine mammal acoustics, um, uh, I guess, training or emphasis or exposure, because it's not one of those things that, okay, I do one field project and I will become a marine mammal bioacoustic expert. You have to have a lengthy period of uh, training and experience. Um, and even if you're a bioacoustician, um, you still need to work with marine mammals because they are much more um, complex uh, in terms of their hearing capabilities. And we still don't know quite enough about them. And even just measuring um, their hearing sensitivities is very hard. It's more, much of the work has been done on captive animals and in wild animals, it's really dolphins that we know a lot more about their hearing information. But then there's also things like using acoustics to monitor um, distribution, occurrence, density, all of those things. And um, all of that goes to say that you need to have very specific skills, knowing how to deploy acoustic recorders, build recorders, uh, analyze the data, process the data, interpret the data, because there's a lot of noise. Um, and there are good softwares and things like that, but I don't think it's something you can just pick up just like that, you need training. And you should always have a question. Shouldn't you should have a question. Every, regardless. Sounds and <laughs> <laughs> regardless, that is the fundamental thing. Without a research question, you can't do anything. Ah, Anand is back. Hey, uh, thank you, Dula, and thank you. Back here. So there, there have been interests from our end. We are very sorry for that. Uh, but I think we had a very fruitful discussions over the past three days and uh, I'm happy that uh, so many questions were posed to all the panelists and uh, they were answered also very well. And uh, the take, key takeaways from this uh, particular conference or uh, webinar series would be, uh, I'll just uh, uh, mention three points that I could uh, uh, recollect. Uh, one thing is uh, the national mission for biodiversity and human well-being that has been proposed uh, now. And uh, now uh, there is a need to, uh, improve it and improve it using uh, or um, uh, enhance its scope by including marine biodiversity research also and uh, looking at how marine biodiversity research and conservation impacts uh, local communities, especially coastal communities. So making probably uh, something called as a marine biodiversity collaborative uh, could be the future. Uh, right now it says just biodiversity collaborative, but we can uh, enhance the scope of uh, the biodiversity collaborative and include uh, marine biodiversity in that. Second thing uh, is uh, we need to start young. We need to start young uh, when creating awareness, when talking about uh, marine mammal science and marine mammal research and conservation. We need to start uh, really early as everybody pointed it out. And uh, lastly, uh, improve connectivity among existing marine mammal researchers and future marine mammal researchers and conservationists, uh, improving connectivity, uh, increasing um, activities such as this particular conference where we are talking, coming together on the same platform and in uh, exchanging ideas, uh, even criticizing each other, that is good, very good, because criticism is the backbone of science. And uh, now I, I, would, uh, I would like to thank all of you and uh, thank you, especially Maridula for joining us so late and we are sorry that uh, we are keeping up, you up uh, so late at night and uh, yeah. uh, also thank you to uh, Deepani uh, for uh, joining us uh, from Ahmedabad. Elrika, I think you are in Bangalore and uh, Vardhan, you're too in Bangalore, I guess. Uh, I'm not sure about your locations, but uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, we have many more questions coming up, but I think we'll answer uh, each query by email now because we are uh, we have already uh, 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 we are already past uh, a lot of time at uh, eleven thirty. Thank you very much. Uh, those are my closing remarks. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your 
presence and uh, your ideas on this uh, great great uh, interaction over last three days so thank you so thank much you. anand thank you thank you for yeah, thank, thank, thank you dr shiva thank you dr shiva thank you smita for being everyone. here yeah. bye bye everyone good night thank you everyone bye good night bye bye bye, bye. 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 bye.